My guest is Dr. Rogerio Vivaldi. Rogerio is the president and chief executive of Sigalon Therapeutics, based in Massachusetts. He has served as an executive at four other drug makers as well, including Genzyme, Spark, and BioVerative. He holds a medical degree from the University of Rio de Janeiro and an MBA from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Welcome, Rogerio. Thank you, David. Pleasure to be here. Rogerio, Genzyme was one of the first, maybe the first drug maker to achieve more than a billion dollars in annual sales from a drug for a rare disease. How did they do it? Yeah, I think it's a, it's like those, this perfect combination. You have the right drug at the right time and, and then you go to multiple countries. The, the model of Genzyme was to have local people driving in a very small teams, very small teams, but uh, driving in each country, a very simple, um, I would say, strategy. Talking with people, do you know about Gaucher disease? Do you know that there is a specific treatment for that disease that is very indeed effective? And then you go to registry, diagnose, so basically we were, we call the international team for Genzyme. We were about 50 people, but 50 people uh, located in 50 different places. So you have myself in Brazil, you have a dear friend in Israel, you have a dear friend in Italy, another one in Japan. And basically we were literally working alone for a couple of years. Uh, and then the drug was magnificent. The, the, the clinical trial that was extremely small, just 12 patients in the pivotal trial, and the 12 patients uh, with a, a very interesting dose response because there was one kid in that group of 12 patients, and the kid was the first one to demonstrate a response. And then they realized that there was a dose per kilogram that was important. When they realized that, done everybody was responding. And, uh, and again, I do remember in the case of Brazil that I had my first, first patient receiving uh, the first drug that was Ceridase was still not a recombinant product, but was a product derived from, the, from placenta. And uh, the patient was doing so fine, but then I was seeing so many more patients and, and I, couldn't put all of them in therapy because uh, there was not uh, completely available in Brazil. And then I was seeing patients dying and patients dying. So after 13 patients dying, 13 funerals that I have been, I wrote a letter to the Minister of Health in Brazil saying, this is, this is too much. This patient is being treated and he is completely transformed you can change the lives of all of these other ones that are very few ones, not too many. So let's do it. And the guy did, and he put this as a national. Um, and, and again, uh, after that for now, uh, this was in 1991. So almost uh, 30 years, uh, the number of patients dying from Gaucher disease is basically very, very small, if none. The effectiveness of treatment was above 95%. And you don't see this every day. Um, I, I think that this was a, a, a really a description of a precision medicine, personalized medicine, and really falling patients. And, and, and that the numbers, I always say that the numbers must be a consequence of the good work and not the target for you. If you target the numbers, the numbers will not come. If, the tar if you target doing the right things, the numbers eventually can come. It's a great story about changing the lives of those patients. And, and 12 patients in the pivotal trial is amazing. Contrast that with tens of thousands of patients in these ongoing vaccine trials, 12 patients. But it, it must be a great drug 
if it can show an effect in just a few patients. So what a great drug. With so few patients uh, who suffer from Gaucher disease, and yet a very successful drug uh, reaching blockbuster status, the only way to do that is with a high price. And fortunately, it's a very valuable drug, which helps justify the high price. But Genzyme was one of the first companies to set a price of, say, $200,000. How was that received by payers and the public? Yeah. First, I think that uh, you need to have a conviction. Um, and Henry Timir, the legendary CEO of uh, Genzyme, who passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago, two or three years ago, uh, Henry was the CEO of Genzyme for over 26 years, and, uh, and he was the one that established the price. So it's true that some countries uh, reacted badly. I, I still remember New Zealand reacting extremely badly. Uh, but then if people had a chance to understand the simple mathematical calculation, you have a very rare number of patients with a very costly manufacturing, with a development system that uh, the price should be high. The first product for Gaucher that started that ball, that the, the, really the range of the 200,000 was derived from placenta. It was necessary 22,000 placentas a year to treat one patient a year. This placenta, for kind of a safety, they were collected in some of the Nordic countries. They were purified uh, through Pasteur Institute in France, and then they were further purified at, in, in, in Cambridge. Uh, so the, the logistics and the production time was about, uh, again, uh, long, many days. Uh, very, very, very soon, Henry realized that he needed to have the recombinant, otherwise we'll not have a product for all patients. And then in a, in a record time, he developed the plant. But again, each manufacturing, and they, he did it through Cho cells, was um, taking about 290 days. So you have a manufacturing process that takes 290 days to produce uh, the protein that you want. Um, and finally, which I think was the, the biggest thing in Henry's uh, legacy was, okay, we have two prices, the price or free price. And, you know, uh, forget everything else. That's, that's, that's it. Um, and for, I believe for over 15 years, Genzyme never increased the price of the product. So for sure, it was the highest, if not the highest price at that time when it started. 15 years later, it was not anymore the highest because many, many products came with a price above that and they were keeping increasing every year, which again, if you increase beyond a certain level, I, I completely, I don't understand that. But uh, Yes, some countries, they, don't, they didn't accept. I still remember when we were trying to explain about the HOPE project, Project HOPE, which was helping us to distribute about 10% of the production for free to all the world. Uh, some countries were actually very unhappy with that. They would say, I, I am paying. Why someone or the other country that Yes, it's not as developed as I am, but why they, they are getting for free? And, and the, our answer was because they can't pay and they want to pay, but they can't. And it's unfair to have patients dying because of that. Um, after you repeat this uh, in a very consistent way, people see that that is what you mean. And uh, at the end, everybody accepted. And of course, the whole industry came behind and that generated a cycle which more investments because it was really getting a good return. So more investments, more drugs, more achievements, more transformations, and then becomes a, a big cycle 
that helped the whole industry. Um, and this is why the rare disease industry became, after Genzyme, uh, pioneering that. It's an amazing story, really interesting story about price. But also, I didn't realize that tens of thousands of placentas, hundreds of days were involved in each product. That's, that's amazing. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it was not easy. Another question about your days at Genzyme. So one of my favorite uh, business school cases is about Genzyme not just being focused on the rare diseases, like Gaucher's disease, which we've been talking about, but also interested in tropical diseases or neglected diseases, like malaria, tuberculosis, Chagas. Why would Genzyme be interested in working on a neglected disease like malaria, tuberculosis, or Chagas? Yeah, I, 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 I would summarize with uh, two reasons. One, because they could. Uh, their R&D team had expertise to do so. They had expertise to help uh, really uh, drug development in these areas. Second, because Genzyme understood that other neglected diseases should have the same chance for transformative drugs as the rare disease. Again, if you, if you think about tuberculosis, when was the last time that you heard about a new drug for tuberculosis? Was uh, probably 55 years ago. Um, and is, is tuberculosis gone? Of course it's not. So, and why didn't have more? It's because of that cycle that I was explaining before doesn't happen with tuberculosis. And, and so Genzyme thought that, okay, is it a, a way to show a corporate social responsibility so that yes, we are getting profits from the rare patients, but we want to turn it back a portion of it to help a, a larger population, particularly in the less uh, developed countries in the most uh, neglected disease. So that was the concept. And, uh, and of course, uh, then uh, if, you, if, if people read the business case, they will see that you need some champions, internal champions in their R&D that are, were passionate about that. Also some champions in the local places where I really wanted, because uh, for example, in Brazil, uh, I have been kind of accused, Brazil, how you can uh, say that Brazil is literally one of the best countries to treat Gaucher when you still have a lot of cases of tuberculosis. I said, well, first, because uh, if we can't do something, it is not an ex excuse to not, something, to not do something else. But then can I help somehow that? And that was the, the, the beginning of that discussion. So uh, me bringing to Henry, Henry, Brazil has one of the largest uh, R&D centers in Latin America, the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation that uh, came from uh, the legendary Oswaldo Cruz and all of the work in Chagas as well. And, and how can we help them? And that was the beginning. And then uh, I, I was very happy that uh, Genzyme understood that and others colleagues in India, other colleagues in other places saw that we could really bring back something to these uh, countries as well. It's a great point about the tremendous need and you can't do everything, but I'm impressed that Genzyme also tried to be in the tropical neglected disease space. And you're right, for tuberculosis, maybe one drug in the last 50 or 60 years for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, I think Johnson & Johnson's bedaquiline. Is, is the only example. So tremendous need. And like you said, that need hasn't gone away. Yep. So after Genzyme, you worked for Spark Therapeutics. Spark received a, a priority review voucher for a rare disease, a rare pediatric disease. Mm -hmm. Should drugs for rare pediatric diseases be eligible for priority review vouchers? Or should we keep those vouchers focused on the neglected tropical diseases 
is there already enough incentive for the rare pediatrics that you, you don't also need the voucher? So do you need the voucher in the rare pediatric disease space or no? I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think we believe, I believe that uh, we need for both. Um, and we need for both. Uh, of course, is the reality is that before offering drug legislation, only very few or none drugs have been developed for rare disease. But after that, more than 300 diseases have treatments that being developed or being approved and brought hope to thousands of patients. There are still more, more than 6,000 rare diseases that have no treatment at all whatsoever. Uh, so again, as I said, and I mentioned the, the example of tuberculosis, I would love to see more things happening. To go into a rare disease, particularly in the pediatric, is not easy. It is absolutely not easy at all. Uh, of course, in the case of SPARC, it was a particular uh, retinal disorder that you have to make the diagnosis very early on. You have to execute and treat very early on. And, and as in many other cases uh, of a pediatric rare disease, if you don't do something at that period or at that window of opportunity, if you have to wait, if you wait too much, the patient will not be there. The patient will be gone, uh, literally gone. And that is a reality of many, many, many diseases. So how to accelerate expedite in a way that is a, is a very good incentive. Besides all the often drug legislation incentives that exist, but I am, I am in a opinion for many, many years that neglected disease should have that incentive. It's interesting because now we are living this unprecedented times of COVID times and the infectious disease is becoming more, okay, what else can we do for infectious disease? How, how else can we do to be better prepared for that uh, from a drug development point of view? And so probably we'll see many more things coming because of that. And I hope that uh, many successful treatments will come because of this, uh, uh, again, call to action time that we are living uh, at, this, at this moment. Well said, I think this is an amazing time amazingly successful time in terms of drug and vaccine development for infectious diseases. So this, I think this could be helpful for the future. You know, in terms of the, uh, in terms of incentives for rare diseases, I think you're right that the Orphan Drug Act has been really important. I, I'm glad you think that the priority review voucher program is also helpful. And I'd say another factor uh, with, the, with the growth of drugs for rare diseases that you mentioned, I think another factor is Genzyme. I think Genzyme showing the way, showing investors, after Genzyme's success with Serazyme, I think investors realized that drugs for rare diseases are not just money losers, that it's yeah. possible to have a return on investment. Yeah. So I think, I, I think you and your colleagues uh, had, had a long lasting impact on the rare disease space even beyond your own products. Yeah, I just feel privileged and honored that I was part of that. Um, and, uh, and of course the founders and, and, uh, and Henry's uh, teams that he put together was absolutely, uh, it, uh, again, because at the end of the day, you need to have a best team. Uh, people have been said that uh, uh, Henry's legacy, probably from Genzyme, you have today almost a, close to 100 CEOs today that were in Genzyme. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's funny that uh, even me, as a, I was the head of the rare disease group, uh, I was the one that actually called the business units, rare disease business unit for the first time. Uh, but I, I have many of my direct report today that they are already CEOs of, uh, of very good biotech companies. And, and so uh, it, it is because we live the time and uh, it was a, it's like the, the R&D people it was a historical, okay, what are you working on the bench right now? And how this work will change someone's life? If you don't know the answer for that, 
you will not receive a budget for that because uh, you can't simply doing something to demonstrate that something experimentally will work. No, you have to understand how that experiment will significantly uh, transform someone's life and putting the patient in the center, not only as what you say, but as to how you feel as a soul. The patient needs to be at the center. Why you do this? Is the market for that? Who, uh, can you imagine if you ask any one uh, expert on marketing, oh, is Gauchetis is a good market opportunity? They will say, no, <laughs> there are no patients. There's, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, they were wrong. And they were wrong so, uh, many, many, many consecutive times. Well said. Um, how will this drug affect patients' lives? That's a, that's a great question to ask. Also fascinating that Genzyme spun off so many CEOs of biotech companies. Yep. Speaking of CEOs of biotech companies, you are the CEO of Sigalon. Uh, tell us about Sigalon, please. Yeah, so uh, again, the reason I joined Sigalon was uh, the purpose of Sigalon is to really develop functional care for patients with chronic disease. During all my career, even in starting my clinic as a, again an endocrinologist in Brazil, dealing with type 1 diabetes. I have type 1 diabetes myself, Dave, for over 46 years. Uh, I always involved, and in, uh, if someone asks, okay, what are you expert on? I am on chronic disease. And of course, most of the rare disease are also chronic disease. But can we finally get to a point to develop functional cure? When I was diagnosed with diabetes, I, I just, okay, I lost my pancreas. How can I replace my pancreas with my brain? That was the, the way to do that. Now, can we have other ways to replace what is deficient. So Siglan uh, uh, was founded by flagship and in conjunction with Bob Langer and Dan Anderson from MIT, where they develop a biomaterials that could protect cells to die when they were uh, uh, implanted or infused uh, into patients. And we know for more than 40 years that the cell therapy should work. The problem is that the body was reacting, immune reaction against those cells and destroying it and killing those cells. Well, what if we encapsulate those cells? Well, people tried that, but then the encapsulation was triggered a fibrosis through to really to cover the whole capsule. Okay, how can we find something that to avoid that fibrosis to happen and leave that capsule we call the spheres to really be a good place where the cells can live and can interact and send their protein uh, to the plasma. So again, at Siglon, we are uh, working on developing functional cure for chronic disease like diabetes, rare blood disorders, uh, hemophilia A is our lead program and also lysosomal storage disorders. Of course, we have a lot of uh, uh, background on that. If you think about what is the current treatment for those disease, put apart diabetes, but for hemophilia, patients receive factor replacement therapy, and the factor produce a peaks and troughs in terms of their protein, which is not what the normal person does. Normal person has a flat, sustainable levels of these proteins. So we believe that having a cell inside of the body secreting this protein will mimic exactly functional how a normal person will do. And if we put the cells in an environment that the cells can live long and be durable with the, with the possibility also that because they don't trigger any immune response, we can redose once if necessary, then we will have a tool to really, okay, the patients will be well-treated. So there is a potential for that. And I think that the time is now 
to pioneer this new modality, and we call shielded living therapeutics, that we encapsulate cells, we implant into the body, and then the cells will produce the proteins that the patient has as a deficiency. What are some of the special challenges with these leave-in therapeutics, these therapeutics that remain in the body? What are the special challenges with regard to reimbursement, uh, regulation, uh, redosing? Yeah, I think that we have, a, I would say, a sequence of challenges, correct? Uh, of course, I am a more a commercial person. Uh, I am now at Signum extremely uh, good, well uh, uh, named uh, scientist working with us, but I, I'm more a commercial person. I say that if I have to deal with the challenge of reimbursement later on, that will be a great problem to have. So now we just entered the clinical stage and we are very happy that we dose our first patient in our phase one, two study, dose escalation stage, study for hemophilia A. Uh, and the challenge is as a new modernity, is, is such to prove that it's feasible, to show that it is safe. First, 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 it is safe. And I feel extremely good that because the cells are in those spheres, we don't interact with the host DNA. And, and so really the safety is, is a, a such high bar for us. And then, can we demonstrate, as we demonstrate preclinical uh, with all the thousands of experience we did in many different species, that yes, there is protein being demonstrated into the plasma. So once we demonstrate this, then I would love to be talking about reimbursement. Uh, from early on at Siglin, we were really very put as a top priority, the manufacturing process to make sure that we had something at scale that could offer a cost of goods that would not be too high. Because of that would uh, become another challenge for you to really commercialize through all the world um, your technology. So, and I think that at scale, uh, our technology will not be uh, more expensive than monoclonal antibodies, which is um, again, in a, in a in an okay uh, range at this point. Well, congratulations, phase one, phase two. This is an exciting time as you learn more about your product. It is an exciting and a busy time. It is indeed. The next segment is overrated or underrated. It's okay. a segment I copied from Tyler Cowan. I'll give you an item and you can tell me whether it's overrated or underrated and you can pass. Overrated or underrated? Sao Paulo, Brazil. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let me let me challenge you now. Sao Paulo, I am from Rio. I am a carioca, a very, uh, we say carioca da gema. So it's a very, very big carioca. So Sao Paulo is terrible. Let me do this for Rio. And so Rio is completely underrated uh, in my view. Rio is the most beautiful city in the world. And, uh, and I can say this, I have traveled the whole world uh, for 10 consecutive years. I was traveling 40 plus times a year internationally. I can, I can say this to you. Uh, it is, is, a, is a combination. He is, has a combination of the, of the ocean, of the mountains, of the nat uh, natural forest, has the largest uh, largest forest in a city in the world uh, that is native forest. And, and besides that, you have 5 million people. So it, it, this, is, this is not a, a common uh, combination. And people are very amazing. The, the really the big problem, and I think that, that that's why sometimes people underrated, uh, people really don't, don't see the good things of Rio. We don't have good politicians. And I don't know how many cities can, can say that, but uh, in Rio, we, are, we have a, 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 a record of uh, really bad, bad politicians. Unfortunately, I'm not proud of them at all. Um, and I don't know how to change that. 
but I, I love that city and, um, and uh, I love uh, uh, being a native of Rio. That's funny, I asked you about Sao Paulo and I think what we know is Sao Paulo is not Rio. I think that's what we can conclude. And yeah. the Rio is definitely- that's it. People sometimes say, oh, but both cities has a big traffic jam hours and etc. Okay, but if you, have, if you are in a traffic and you look to one side, you see the ocean, you look to the other side, you see the mountains, it's not that bad. You just put that sound. In Sao Paulo, if you are there, you look to one side, you have a big building. You look to the other side, you, you see another big building, 22 million people in the city. I, I, you know what? I, that's not my taste. Could be, and the, the, the people from Sao Paulo say that they have the best restaurants in the world. They have, okay, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not me. It's not my, my taste. Well said. Speaking of Rio and, and Brazil, overrated or underrated? Hosting the Olympics. Overrated, overrated, overrated. And um, uh, it's, uh, I, I noticed that every, almost every time, a majority of each country's Olympic facilities became white elephants. And, uh, and I have a big problem with that. I saw this in Greece, I saw this in Rio. Of course, it, it is, I, I have to say, Rio Olympics Games in 16 was the first time I was attending an Olympic Games. I love it. I loved it. I think that I attended maybe 15, 15 things uh, and it was amazing. But then uh, all that uh, such expensive uh, thing, lots and lots of corruption, uh, and today we are, again, we are 2020. Uh, the main Olympic village, the main Olympic thing was, was not in a good shape at all. Uh, I was a very proud father because of one of my daughters, uh, she's an architect and she was invited as soon as she graduated to join the, the Olympic village project. So she was uh, in the group building 33 towers, 17 floors each. Uh, but after the Olympic Games, they sold less than a half of those thousands and thousands of a great, great condos. Um, and, and this is just a one example. Many stadiums, they were, uh, even our famous uh, soccer stadium, Maracanã, uh, was almost to put it down and they built a new one the new one is not the old one. Nobody loves the new one. But why they did what they did was to have that expenses and having that kind of a possibility to, to make it more. So again, I think it's overrated. Uh, and, uh, and I think that we should think more about the athletes. Many athletes, they have no condition to go to the Olympic Games at all. Um, people should rethink how can we do this in a much smaller scale? Uh, uh, because I don't see in the future uh, countries with uh, good managers, good politicians, uh, really seeing a return of their investments at all. So I think it's overrated. Makes sense. Of the Olympic sports you saw in Rio, which did you enjoy the most? Well, uh, I loved the, uh, the beach volleyball, uh, love it. It was absolutely great, absolutely great. Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting because now that I, I, I'm living in Boston for the last 10 years, I became a, a big basketball uh, fan. I, am, I, I, I have season tickets for Boston Celtics and I, so I, I watched some of basketball games there. Uh, it was not intense as an NBA game, so it was, but at the beach volleyball was, was superb. And then I was able to see track and field. Uh, I, I saw uh, the, uh, the fastest guy from Jamaica, and, uh, and that was an experience that, uh, you know, the flash was absolutely great. Um, he was a such charismatic athlete. 
and, and you had 65,000 people cheering for the same guy was, was uh, an incredible. So the track and field probably would be number one. The beach volleyball was number two. My guest today has been Dr. Rogerio Vivaldi. Thank you, Rogerio. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you.